I want to switch gears and I want to talk to you about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and his campaign. Um, you have been, uh, you know, you, you've been to Palestine, you've covered Palestine and Israel, you've been a critic of Israel and Israel's um, policies towards the Palestinian, their treatment of the Palestinian people. Also, though, during the pandemic, you were also very critical of the government and the mandates and big pharma. And so Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is somebody who very critical also of the pandemic response and big pharma and everything that happened during the pandemic, which is how he really shot up in prominence and people really started to support him. Uh, same thing with Ron DeSantis. I mean, Ron DeSantis, I think, also had a similar appeal, right, where a lot of people were like, wow, this guy's really good when it comes to the pandemic. But then as we started hearing more from Ron DeSantis about other things, it was like, wait a minute, okay, um, you know, there's, there's obviously everybody's layered and there's, there's a lot of dimension. But when it comes to RFK Jr., what do you think it is? A lot of people are wondering why he is so staunchly supportive of Israel. Like, what is it about Israel that he, you know, he's with Rabbi Shmuley, pictures with the Israeli flag, um, what do you think it is that is that's driving him? Do you think he really truly feels that way, believes that, um, or is there something else there? I will give a very honest answer, starting just with the fact that, as I think people would say from my or see from my tweets early on, I was very enthusiastic about RFK's campaign. In fact, when Max and I came to LA last year. We went and met with him. Uh, this was for the Defeat the Mandates rally. We went, we went and saw him. I don't even think he would necessarily remember me, but we had lunch at his place and I had a, gr I had a great time. And I walked away with the impression that he was going to be running for president. <laughs> and I, as he came forward and announced, I was thinking I, I would actually this is a campaign that I could become excited about where I would even want to put my own effort and, and legwork behind to help get him elected. I truly, truly believed that his message of peace, of uh, criticizing the oligarchy and the intelligence industry or the, and agencies, the, the deep state, the unelected deep state, bringing up what happened, the state-directed murder of his father and uncle, and having a reckoning with that period in our history and really trying to say what happened in this moment, what happened to American democracy and what happened to our state since then. I, I was like, this is what we need. We're in the middle of this insane proxy war with Russia. We just emerged from the COVID catastrophe. I, 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 I was gung-ho, which is why I was so crushed when... For some reason, Israel was this became this issue he decided to take on. And I, I said before on other programs, you're running for president of the United States. So if you were doing an event, making the case for any other foreign country, it would be a little weird. But apparently for Israel, that's yeah. OK. An entire event as a candidate making the case for Israel. OK, I mean, I know a lot about Venezuela, but if I were running for president, I would never be making the case for Venezuela. I mean, that would just be weird. But for Israel, apparently, it's okay. Um, and, you know, privately and then ultimately through the very public exchange we had with him kind of through the Jimmy, Jimmy Dore show and, and social media saying, look, do you want to talk about these issues? Of course, my husband, Max, who wrote two books about Israel, including one that really, I think, demonstrates what it is, a horrible apartheid regime. Uh, and so he said that he would he would offer to have a just a, a, an exchange with Kennedy and at a debate or a discussion. It doesn't even have to be a debate. Let's just talk. And the fact that he refused to do that is while demanding that everybody debate him on these COVID issues and saying that he stands for this kind of open discussion is what made me really start to question him. And you say, why? Why did he uh, decide that Israel was the hill that he wanted to die on? I think it's pretty clear. If you need, if you're going to run for president in the United States, you need money and you need big money. And so I don't really understand how anyone could go and do an event with Shmuley Boteic 
making the case for an apartheid regime unless there was money involved. And the big problem here for me is that the reason that I admired RFK Jr. and the reason that I supported him was because I saw him as someone who had integrity. I saw him as someone who was honest and most of all, someone who was open to discussion. And the fact that he shut it down on that one issue led me to believe that he doesn't have as much integrity as I thought. And worst of all, on top of the fact, I mean, we can get into my experience covering Palestine and what I've seen there and how much it disgusts me to see someone like him smearing the Palestinian people and not the people who built a wall through Bethlehem and uh, continue to spill the blood of in innocence on the birthplace of Jesus Christ. I mean, he's a Catholic. He should be concerned about these things. It's not the Palestinians who are doing that. It's the Israelis. Um, aside from that, it's the fact that you cannot be pro-peace and you cannot be critical of the global corporate oligarchy in a genuine way. And you can certainly not be against medical apartheid if you support the Israeli apartheid regime, because they will be the first to march you into a war with Iran. And by the way, is it a coincidence that all of the vaccines and also the apartheid technology that RFK Jr. is so critical of and defined his career partially by being oppo in opposition to were tested in Israel? Israel is the testing right. ground for this system that he claims to be fighting against in the United States. Israel's is where it is grown and they want to export that to the entire world. All right. And they're right in there with Ukraine. They they they're a ticking time bomb and a catastrophe waiting to happen in the region when that war comes. And believe me, it's going to come. It's not going to be pretty for Israel. And Israel is going to want the US to get involved and sacrifice our own security in our own interests to protect it. So he can't. I cannot take him seriously on those other issues as long as he's getting out there saying he's gonna define himself. By, and I would love to convince him otherwise. I would be happy again still to have this, con and I don't care. I'm not one of those people who's uh, you know trying to get their name in media by attacking people and demanding that they talk to me. I really don't care. And I will say, I do think that his campaign suffered from it. He demonstrated that if you're running yeah. an insurgent campaign, Israel's a losing issue. What do you think? I mean, don't you think he's kind of suffered from it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I do think that Israel's a losing issue if you are trying to say that we want to change U.S. foreign policy. Um, we want to get out of the grips of control of, of, of uh, actors or whoever that, who shouldn't be in control of the government, right? Like Israel has uh, an an you know, like Bill Gates with the pharmaceutical industry, like Bill Gates with our medical industry, who just has just an enormous amount of influence that he really should not be having over health in America. Israel has a disproportionate amount of influence over our foreign policy in America, and we should all be questioning that. Whether a person supports Israel or not, whether they agree, you know, somebody could actually sit there and think, oh, the Palestinians, yeah, they're all terrorists and they're all trying to hurt Israel. And so that's why Israel does what it does. I mean, they could make excuses for Israel all day, whatever. Whatever a person wants to think, they should still question the fact that this little country in the Middle East has a disproportionate amount of influence on our political system and on our foreign policy. And we should not want that. No matter if we agree with them or not, we should we should want as the people to be in control of our country, of our health system, of our politics, of our foreign policy. Right. We, the people, should want to have control over that, not these other forces. And, you know, the issue with Israel, I think that really brings up that you've brought up a really great point with, you know, how can he be this kind of anti-war candidate, peace candidate and yet be so staunchly for Israel, because Israel's the one country, I can say, the one country. I'm not, maybe there's, you know, Europe for sure, probably, but outside of Europe and outside of that historic um, ally, you know, relationship that we have with Europe and fighting with them in wars, Israel's a country that if they go to war, we will put American boots on the ground for that war. We're not putting American boots on the ground in Ukraine. We're probably not going to put American boots on the ground, let's say, of South Korea, North Korea. Well, we have a base there. I mean, but 
really, you can rile up because of the rhetoric around Israel and the politicians all of these years around Israel. You're going to be able to rile up Americans to go and send their kids to fight a war for Israel at this point. I do think the mentality is there. They already do. That's the frustrating thing. We already pay for their whole military and we send, I mean, what percentage of their current military, uh, how many of their parents were born in New York? Seriously. And I'm not saying that. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's weird. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's the one... It's, I, I just think it's the one area of the world, like even with South Korea, and yeah, we have a base there and whatnot. And so if there was a war, we would have Americans, I guess, fighting in it. But Americans, I think, would question it. And they would say, why are we doing this? Why are we over there? Why, why are we sacrificing American lives for these wars? But when it comes to Israel, I do think that a lot of Americans would say, well, because it's Israel. So of course, we're doing this for Israel. And that is still the mentality. And that is a frustrating mentality because Israel has proven itself to be quite capable of defending itself and doing whatever it needs and being ruthless in getting its needs met. And so they don't really need our help anymore, but they want it, of course, like any country. They would love to have, you know, the U.S. exported military industrial complex come to their rescue and to their aid because that's what we're exporting. We export military might and protection, right? That's our big export around the world. Um, But Yeah, it it is concerning that he is so gung-ho. And that was my criticism as well, which was like, why do I see more photographs of you with the Israeli flag than the American flag? That should be, that's a problem, I think, for anybody running for president of the United States. You know, why are you advocating for a foreign country? If it weren't the Israeli flag, people would think that's pretty weird. And honestly- It would be very weird. Like, imagine that Chinese flag or the Russian flag. I mean, nobody would go for that. Nobody. But it's okay if it's Israel. Totally honestly, if he had even, I get it. He's running for president and he's running as a Democrat. If he had just gone, even and given a speech at APAC, I wouldn't have given up on him. (laughs) I wouldn't have written him off as a phony or something. I would have said, okay, I get it. Everybody has to especially if you're running as a Democrat, go say some things about why they have a special love for Israel. Uh, But this, what he did was way step further in terms of actually be like, he was actually working with lobbyists and, 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 and in a way acting as a lobbyist for a foreign government. There's no point for an American citizen. He, it was called making the case for Israel. That was his event. So, I mean, seriously, man, that's just not, that's not normal. And by the way, when he did that event with Shmuley Boteik, Shmuley went on some crazy rant about how Sirhan Sirhan, a Palestinian, killed RFK Jr.'s father. RFK Jr. doesn't even believe that. He does not believe Sirhan right. Sirhan. And he didn't even correct him, all right? So this is a crazy, deranged race hustler, Rabbi Shmuley, on stage with you, talking about your own father's murder. And he didn't even like say, oh, just for the record, I don't believe that that's really what happened. And really, right. I'm thinking, come right. on, man. I thought you had character and integrity. And please build it back up because I would love to see it. Yeah, I so I haven't given up on him. I, I think because in my mind, all of the presidential candidates have to. It, I would like the culture to shift. I want Americans to wake up and shift the culture on this. But at this point, all all candidates on the right and the left, Republicans, I feel like, have to do it even more so. But Democrats and Republicans, no matter who they are, have to say they're pro-Israel, they love Israel, they make the case for Israel. Otherwise, I think less than getting money from the Israeli lobby or from big businesses that support the Israeli lobby, I think less so about the money of gaining it. I think it's the fear of being shme- of being smeared and taken down by the lobby if you're seemingly against Israel, that is when they really start coming after you. And that, so to me, it's, they're all doing it. And so I, I, because everybody does that, it's not okay. I, like I said, I would like the culture to shift, but I do think he is so much better on every other policy issue practically that I'm like, well, um, if he's just the same and we're dealing with status quo and same old, same old with Israel, it's not like he's, advocating for more than what we're already doing if he's advocating you know if it's just keeping the status quo then i can 
I'll, I guess I'll just have to live with that and hope to get some other things that I think are beneficial for our for you know moving forward in America. I just want to make two points on that. The first being that when he in, initially eased into the crazy pro-Israel line of his campaign, I was willing to accept it to a level, as I said, because I'm like, oh, OK, I get everybody has to do it. But also because I right. truly believe as someone who's very. Who follows the region very closely, I don't believe the fate of Israel is going to be decided in Washington. It's going to be decided in the region. And ultimately, whether or not the U.S. president is always going to be pro-Israel, what we do and what we say here is not going to determine what happens with Israel. Israel is lost. Israel is already imploding politically, internally. It has nowhere to go in the region, especially as the Gulf Arab states and Iran even consolidate an alliance that doesn't suggest that Israel has a very bright future, especially as they continue these insane attacks on Muslim places of worship and on Christians. People in the region and in the world are going to become very upset with Israel. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was thinking, okay, whether or not the U.S. president is super pro-Israel, fine. Uh, it's not going to change Israel's fate. I think Israel's fate is sealed and it's not good. But on the second point, I did think that there was, uh, you say all the candidates are the same. The only one that I could really compare RFK to is obviously Trump. And Trump has already said that in the second administration, Jared Kushner will not be welcome. Jared Kushner and Ivanka. And mm. Jared Kushner was the link. He's He was the link with uh, Trump and this Shmuley Boteic super Zionist, ultra Zionist network, Likud network in, in the United States. Right. And so I think once Trump, and, and I'm sure there are reasons that Trump has for that. Once Trump said that, I think though that network was looking for a place to go. I think they said, oh, shoot, we don't have Trump anymore. And maybe so they ran to RFK. And so it was this, it, and it's all has to do with this, again, overall political breakdown in Israel, where Netanyahu, after leading Israel and, and being a close ally of the United States for all this time has kind of fallen out of favor. He's now branded as one of these authoritarian dictators as if, as if he doesn't honestly represent the face of Israel. In fact, the face of Israel, his opponents are much worse. Um, but as he's fallen out of favor, I think there is this slice of the pro-Zionist lobby that is looking for another political home and that they just kind of took advantage of RFK Jr. And yeah, if he ever wants to break away from that. I think it would be very important for a Kennedy to fall on the right side of history when it comes to Israel and Palestine. It would be really good for his own legacy to learn. I think he should go. I think he should go and see it himself yeah. with Roger Waters or someone else. Go look at the apartheid wall. Walk as I did in Hebron in the, in, in the West Bank, which is a Palestinian town, ancient Palestinian town, where there are Israeli settlements built on the hill above it. So they actually have to build a cage on the bazaar because Israelis are throwing bags of piss and trash onto the Palestinians down below all day. I saw that with my own eyes. And then when I walked to the end of the bazaar, I wanted to go into the Jewish district and see some of the religious sites there. And my Palestinian guide, who was the is the kindest man in the world, had to wait there at the gate for me at the checkpoint because the Israelis would not, he was literally not allowed to cross through an arbitrary checkpoint set up by the Israeli regime. I think if RFK Jr. Right. saw that and met the people in Bethlehem, as I have with his own eyes, there's no way he wouldn't agree with me. I just know that because no human being could yeah. walk away with another impression. It's true. It's true. When you see it with your own eyes, and I've been to that same bazaar and walked through there, and I even walked through the the Jewish only settlement, the area that my guide also had to stay behind, and I got kind of chased out of that area um, I, by some settlers that were very aggressive. Um, but yeah, I think once you're there and you see it, there is no way you can walk away from that and say, all is fine. Don't worry about it. They, they, or they deserve it. They deserve this treatment or, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it is, 
it, it hurts it's insane. The soul. And I think, yeah, it actually, it really does. The soul. It's to be what Israel is. It will uh, take away. It'll it'll attack anything that is human in you. You will think this is so anti-human. This is so hateful, and it's so heartbreaking. How is it that I'm paying for this? Yeah, it's pretty. It's uh, it's definitely an awakening, eye-opening experience. I definitely recommend everybody do it and uh, go. There's plenty of different you know, uh, companies that'll take your know, organizations that will, that you can go and do these tours and see for yourself. And they don't say anything. They don't need to say anything. So nobody's indoctrinating anybody. There's no need for words. You just walk through it. You see it for yourself. You experience it for yourself. And it's a whole different thing. It's, it's unreal. Unlike anything we could ever imagine actually happening. Like I came back thinking planet. like, yeah, it is. It is like going to another planet. It was like, when I came back, I thought, my gosh, this is like, you know, when you're a kid and you read about what happened to Native Americans and the colonizing and the atrocities that they went through, and we all look back now and go, oh, it was really bad. You know, that shouldn't have happened. But, but oh, well, oh, here's America, right? Like, that's how we're kind of taught. Um, and it was like watching it in real time. I mean, it was like opening up a history book and being transported back to how Native Americans were being treated by the colonizers. And it was like, oh, my gosh, this is happening now in real time, in real life today with industrial with with industrial level technology <laughs> yeah and yeah so it's like yeah it's a very bizarre thing well hopefully one day you'll get the opportunity to maybe take him on a trip and see and maybe he can see for himself i doubt it but one can hope okay. right um anya it's been really wonderful chatting with you tonight really appreciate um your time and your insight I know you cover a lot of, you know, you're you're excellent with geopolitics, covering a lot of different regions of the world. But really, this Venezuela topic, I think, is so interesting because I do think it is a glimpse into how the U.S. operates the the new like neoliberal foreign policy that the U.S. has adopted. I think it's important for all Americans to learn about what has happened in Venezuela and the attitudes around Venezuela in order for us to understand all of the other conflicts that the U.S. is getting us involved in and the money that is spent, and what is it really for. I think it's all very eye-opening. So really appreciate um, you being here. Again, the the book is Corporate Coup, Venezuela, and the End of U.S. Empire. Um, it is coming out, so it's, it's not out yet, but there have been a lot of people giving endorsements to it, Tucker Carlson, Roger Waters, uh, Oliver Stone. So a lot of great people have uh, given Anya many props for this book and really excited for it. So when is it actually coming out? When can people get it? Right now, the publisher has the date in November. I know some people have ordered it on Amazon, which says January, but yeah. I, I would trust the publisher for the more updated date or more current date. And yeah, it's basically, it uses Venezuela as a blueprint to understand modern U.S. hybrid regime change war. It's something that they apply all across the world, whether in Iran, Russia, Ukraine, even back in 2014 in the lead up to the Maidan coup. But it also yeah. show, tells the story of the world that is rising up against this Western imperial hegemonic order. And uh, pretty much we're, we're living in their world now. <laughs> so I think the faster Americans learn about it and accept our place in this multipolar world, the better. All right. Many of you guys have heard me talk about gold and how my family has used gold to escape all kinds of conflicts um, from Vietnam to Iran and here finally to the United States. And it's really because they have, and th that's a pretty true for a lot of, when you talk to a lot of refugee groups, a lot of people were able to flee and have resources because they were carrying gold with them. And that is because gold is one asset that has withstood economic upheaval and geopolitical conflicts. It has a history of being incredibly stable. All countries recognize it. They understand exactly what it is when they see it. So a lot of people are interested in moving their investments into gold and diversifying and not just relying on the dollar. Well, if you visit birchgold.com slash Kim, you're going to get a free info kit. And the experts there at Birch Gold are going to walk you through how you yourself can also get yourself invested into gold. So maybe you want to do just a little bit. Maybe you want to hold physical gold and keep it in a safety deposit box or in your own home safe, or maybe you want to convert your existing 401k or IRA into an IRA in precious metals. The experts at Birch Gold are going to walk you through whatever it is that is going to work for you. They're going to hold your hand through the entire process. 
Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. So visit birchgold.com slash Kim to get your free info kit.